Hey everybody, you are listening to Renewal Cast, a weekly podcast that features interviews, discussions, and teaching on various biblical and theological subjects. And we do this because we believe that our minds are to be shaped and renewed by the life-giving and transforming Word of God through the power of the Holy Spirit. So we pray for the next few minutes as you listen, uh, you'll just see Jesus more clearly. Today on the podcast, we have a special guest with us, Dr. James Renahan. He has written several books. He's taught on the subject of the the London Baptist Confession. He's coming out with a a book soon on the the second London Baptist Confession. So we're going to talk to him today about what it means to subscribe to a confession. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Renewal Cast today. Today on the podcast, we have a a special guest with us. Uh, Dr. Renahan is with us. We're going to talk about the 1689 Confession. Uh, If you remember, we uh, spent a considerable amount of time going through that confession. Now we're going to talk a little bit about how, what it means to subscribe to that and how people can subscribe. And what if you have a an issue with uh, a point in the confession, how do we handle some of those things? So I think this is going to be a, a really good conversation today. So uh, let's just jump in. Uh, Dr. Renahan, would you just share with us a little bit about yourself and about your ministry, help us to get to know you as we kind of uh, start this conversation? Oh, sure. I'm a native New Englander. So is my wife. I've been married for almost 44 years. We have five children. They all profess faith. Two of my sons are pastors in Reformed Baptist churches. Uh, You've had Sam on your podcast before, so you know him a little bit. I was ordained to the gospel ministry in 1984, have pastored churches in New York, Massachusetts, and California. For 20 years, I was the dean of the Institute of Reformed Baptist Studies at Westminster Seminary in Escondido, California. And about four years ago, we uh, moved to Mansfield, Texas, and took what was an institute and have developed it into a full uh, seminary curriculum that's now called International Reformed Baptist Seminary. You'll notice we kept the IRBS acronym. All right. Very, yeah, very good. Very good. Well, just again, thank you for thank you for coming on today. It's just really appreciative for us to be able to to have to get to get your insight into some of these things. So, uh, as I said before, we've we've talked about uh, on this podcast the the 1689 London Baptist Confession somewhere around uh, 60 podcasts Jay counted and mm-hmm. somewhere around there. Maybe you could just give us a, a basic outline of the 1689. Okay. I would be happy to do that. Uh, of course the me. Second London Confession or the 1689 follows largely the pattern of uh, the Westminster Confession that it's based upon. And they didn't think in terms of an outline, at least I've never seen indications that they do so. But, you know, I think we can infer an outline into the Confession. I, I see four basic units or sections where there are common themes. The first six chapters I call First Principles, which lay down the, uh, the fundamentals of the faith on Scripture on the doctrine of God as it was understood or or as it has historically been understood by Christians. The second section is from chapter 7 through chapter 20. I call that the covenant. Chapter 7 is of God's covenant, and then chapters 8 through 20 uh, in various ways lay out principles about the covenant, how we are to understand it. The third section or unit, as I call it, I call, I think I call it freedom and boundaries, and it's about Christian liberty and how Christian liberty is to function in our lives. How, how does the Lordship of Christ affect us in the way that we live, both in the church and in the world around us? And then the final two chapters I call the last things because they deal with eschatology, personal and cosmic eschatology. What can we expect at the resurrection and what will happen on the last great day? So it's a, it's a fairly simple outline. I think it's pretty straightforward, and it, it sort of builds upon itself as it moves forward. Well, something that we didn't spend a, a lot of time on was subscription or levels of subscription. We didn't really talk about those things. So when people talk about the levels of subscription or subscribing to the confession, can you help us to understand what they mean uh, by that? Yeah, those, those are important words these days. Uh, they've, they've come into some prominence. When I teach my class, I identify about 10 different levels of subscription. Subscription in itself means uh, committing yourself to a document. 
And of course, it means, theoretically, it means to sign your name to it. You subscribe to it. You sign your name underneath subscribe. But we use it metaphorically to talk about our commitments to the confession of faith. And uh, if you want me to run through these 10, I can do that for you. Or if you want me to summarize a little bit, I, I could do that, uh, make it a little simpler. Yeah, that'd be great to, to go through the to go through Which the one? Yeah, you can go through, go through oh, all 10 okay. if you want. That'd be great. <laughs> all right. All right. Here, here are my 10. Different people will present these differently, okay? So I'm, I'm not trying to be the oracle on these things. This is just a way that I've categorized them. And I'll go from loosest to strictest, okay? Number one, doctrine divides, love unites. That, believe it or not, that's a form of confessional subscription that says we don't need confessions and creeds. We just want to, we love Jesus and we want to love each other. Number two is what I call the Bible alone subscription. That's where individuals or churches say we don't need anything else. All we have is the Bible. It sounds good, but it doesn't work very well because usually congregations like that have an unwritten confession of faith. And if you go in there and you preach something that differs from them, let, let's say, and I've encountered this, let's say that they're strong dispensationalists and you go in and, and you preach uh, covenant theology, that, don't, that won't go too well because they do have an unwritten confession of faith. So it, it doesn't really work. There's, there's a lot more we could say about each one of these. The third category that I uh, identify is what I call substance of doctrine subscription. And that simply focuses attention on the gospel as it's found in the confession. It, it views the, the person and work of Christ and what he has done as the center. And everything else is relatively important or unimportant, but it, it doesn't have the, uh, the centrality that uh, the gospel does. So churches that would hold to substance of doctrine subscription would agree on the nature of the gospel and give a great deal of uh, uh, laxity on many, many other points. The fifth is what the Presbyterian Church in America has adopted. It's called good faith subscription. And good faith subscription basically says we will trust each other when we say that we subscribe to the confession of faith. Now, it's much more detailed and much more nuanced than that. I'm just giving you the most generic rundown. So if somebody hears the podcast and they say, well, no, we, we, we have more to it than that. I understand that. Okay, we're just trying to be generic here. The sixth category is what one man once called common ground subscription. His church holds to two confessions of faith, and they subscribe to the doctrines that are held in common between those two confessions. It's, it's a Baptist church in another country, and um, it's, it's an interesting take on things, but it really is a minimalist view of subscription to confessions. The seventh is a category that has been debated in the Orthodox Presbyterian Church, and it's called animus imponentis subscription. It basically means that the confession is to be understood according to the, to the spirit of the adopting body. So that in, in, a, in a situation like a Presbyterian denomination, if the denomination says this is how this part of the confession of faith should be understood, then that's what everyone is committed to when they subscribe to it. So the, the spirit animus of the imposing, imponentist body, you take it in that way. So that, for example, in the OPC, they've had long debates about the nature of creation. Is it a six 24-hour days or is it longer periods of time? And when the denomination rules and says this is how, how it is to be understood, then that is what is required of the ministers in the church. The eighth category is the one that I hold to. It's called strict subscription or oftentimes full subscription. I used to use the word full more often. Now I've gone for strict uh, more commonly just because I think it, it's better. We A long time ago, we started using the language of full uh, in the days of the first President Bush to be kind, kinder and gentler, but uh, I'm not sure that kinder and gentler always does what you want it to do. And since terminology implies or, or specifically focuses on strict subscription, I've come to adopt that. And that means that we adopt all of the doctrines in the document as our own. It doesn't mean that we agree necessarily with every single word in the confession. We might prefer one form of phraseology over another. For example, in chapter 2 of Second London, at the beginning of the first paragraph, it alters the language of the Westminster Confession. The doctrine is the same, but the, the language has changed. Someone might prefer the language of Westminster. 
Okay. I don't have an issue with that because the doctrine is the same. So you might not like the way something is worded, but you want to be committed to the doctrine as it's stated. The ninth category that is what I call historical subscription. And that means that we would adopt a confession of faith with, with a commitment to some of the cultural uh, ideas that were present in the day when the confession was written. Let me give you two examples. One of them is political system. Of course, our confessions of faith come out of a monarchy, a system with uh, a king and parliament. Because those churches submitted to and accepted a king and a parliament, does that mean that when we adopt their confession of faith, we're committed to the same thing? And I would say, no, it doesn't. When we read the chapter in the confession of faith that deals with the civil magistrate, we can apply it to our own American republic system as opposed to the British monarchy parliamentarian system. Another example I would give is uh, in terms of, of the background material of eschatology. You know, most, if not all, early modern commentators on the book of Revelation held what has been called a historicist view of interpreting that book. And what, what that means is that they believed that it was given to the church as something of a prehistory so that we might know what God's purpose is as the centuries pass. And one of the, the things you find when you read those old commentaries on the book of Revelation is they're frequently asking the question, where are we right now? As history unfolds, as it's recorded for us in the book of Revelation, in what chapter are we at? And what could we expect to come next? Well, there aren't many people today who hold that kind of a historicist view of the book of Revelation. And I would argue that uh, it's not required of us. So historical subscription thinks about categories like that and says, no, uh, because we, we adopt their eschatology, it doesn't mean that we adopt their system of interpretation of the book of Revelation. And then the, the final category that I speak about is what I called absolute or jot and tittle subscription. And that is where you're required to subscribe, not just to the doctrines of the confession, but to every word and every phrase as they're expressed in the confession of faith. It's a very narrow view. There are some who hold that view, very strict churches. They tend to be uh, small and highly critical of others who disagree with them. I don't certainly don't advocate absolute subscription in, in that way. So there's 10 categories. Well, wow, that's good. Dr. Renahan, so... In kind of doing some reading, and in, in, in the past, I've, I've read like articles by Gonzalez and Waldron, and they, they talk more of a substantial. They use different little different terminology. Substantial subscription. Where would that fall on your in your eight? Well, I think it probably fits into system subscription or good faith subscription, or maybe common ground subscription if there is more than one confession involved. Substance of doctrine, substantial, so somewhere in there. It would be um, a little bit broader than what strict subscription is. Okay. Okay, and then that leads us to, I, I'd make maybe uh, like the Antichrist. So to be in your category of full or, strip or strict subscription, do I have to believe that the Pope is the final Antichrist? Or can I just believe that he is a antichrist? Well, okay, that's a, I think that that's that's one of the two most common, commonly objected phrases in the confession. The other one being ten three infants dying in infancy, elect infants dying in infancy. Let me say this: that at the after the time of the Reformation, when when you go beyond the commonly accepted orthodox doctrines of the faith, the, the doctrine of the Trinity, the person of Christ, the work of Christ. It has been pointed out that there were two doctrines that were accepted by uh, all of the, the churches, except for Socinians and Arminians. And one of them, of course, was justification by faith alone. And the other one is that the Pope is the Antichrist. This, this was the universal view of the Reformed churches after the Reformation. Now, I would, I, I would argue like this. Most people misunderstand what 26.4 is about, because that's where the statement is. It's not a statement about eschatology. You, you use the modifier last antichrist. That's not in, in the confession. That's not there. It's, it's not about eschatology. It's about ecclesiology. And if you think through the, the paragraph, the first half of the paragraph makes claims for Christ and his lordship. The second half of the paragraph speaks about the Pope, but it contrasts Christ's claims to lordship with a human's claim to lordship, which is focused on the Pope of Rome. 
So when you read it in terms of ecclesiology, I think you have to say the Pope is Antichrist because he claims for himself the right on earth to rule over the church. Now, there's, there are more problems that are associated with rejecting the doctrine. For example, in chapter 8 of Christ the Mediator, no, 8, 9, I'm sorry, this office of mediator between God and man is proper only to Christ, who is the prophet, priest, and king of the church of God, and may not be either in whole or any part thereof transferred from him to any other. Now, there's a, there's a direct relationship between that statement and 26.4, which speaks about the Pope as Antichrist. The same in chapter 21 of Christian Liberty, God alone is Lord of the conscience and has left it free from the doctrines and commandments of men which are in anything contrary to his word or not contained in it, so that to believe such doctrines or obey such commands out of conscience is to betray true liberty of conscience and the requiring of an implicit faith and absolute and blind obedience is to destroy liberty of conscience and reason also. No, it doesn't say Rome. It doesn't say the Pope there, but that's clearly who they have in mind. And and there are other places in the confession. You know, what happens when you take an exception to one place, sometimes you forget that it it's it's like a tree and its roots, and it's connected to a lot of other places. And you the, the decision to remove a statement profoundly affects what is said elsewhere. I would argue that these two paragraphs that I've just read are preparing for and related to the question of the Pope. So, yes, you do need to subscribe to that. Thank you. Let me say two more things. Okay, one more thing. Let me point you to Calvin's commentary on Second Thessalonians, too. Because, you see, that's where people are, are troubled, because they don't see the Pope in Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Read Calvin's commentary, and then a really helpful treatment of this that doesn't say anything about the Pope, never mentions him, but I found it incredibly helpful, is Greg Beale's NIV application commentary on Second Thessalonians. Now, if you're familiar with Dr. Beale's work, you know that he's dealt with the temple and the church, and I think he does a great job of pointing out all of the churchy language that is present in Second Thessalonians chapter 2. You read those two expositions, Calvin clearly is dealing with Rome. Greg Beale doesn't seem to be in his mind, but he gives you the, the, the exegetical factors for it. And I would say, man, it's, it's a compelling case. Are there different kinds of exceptions? Yes. I think I've used the word before, quibbles. A, a quibble might just be, you know, wishing that a different word had been used in this place or that. But you say, okay, I, I can live with it, even though I, I, I wish that they had used a slightly different, different term. Exceptions are uh, acknowledged disagreements with the confession of faith. And uh, there is a place for people to take exceptions, but I think that they need to do so very carefully. They need to, to recognize, as I just said, the, the relationships that exist within the confession of faith so that uh, they don't, you know, if, if I just put a hole in my shirt, it affects the whole shirt. When you, when you take an exception to the confession of faith, you probably do, in one way or another, affect the whole doctrine, uh, the whole document. So you have to be careful with that. But I, I, if somebody takes an exception, I would want them to be honest in doing so and say, okay, this is, this is what they meant. I don't mean it that way. And so I can't agree with the confession of faith at that point. On the Sabbath is a point, I think, where a lot of people have questions. They, they read it, and it, it sounds Sabbatarian. Is it agreeing with the canons of Dort and the Heidelberg Catechism? I think when we went through it, we kind of said, we like how it's worded there better. Or is that an actual exception? Or is it Sabbatarian in the London Baptist Confession? Uh, well, I, I've got two questions for you. What do you mean by Sabbatarian? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and what is it? What can what is the language that you liked better in Dort and Heidelberg as opposed to Second London or Westminster? Well, I think the if I remember, John can answer what. A, well, what I think he means uh, the language world. that personally I that I preferred in I forget where it was. I think it was Dort. It, it spoke of uh, no recreations except for that that interferes with public worship type of stuff, whereas. Uh, the 1689 basically says no recreations worship you know basically you know reading hearing the word of god all day long kind of thing 
and it just it the wording just seemed a little bit more like I I, I don't want to I, I just seemed it just seemed more like the spirit of of of, of what the new covenant felt like to me when I when I when I study it I guess the of course I believe in the ongoing principle of the fourth commandment I believe that I, I believe that uh, the 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 principal thing there is the church coming together on the Lord's day and worshiping together as a body um, absolutely and it is a day of rest absolutely as a uh, one in seven absolutely but you know, if if in the afternoon or nothing going on, if I want to play some catch with my son across the street or or something like that, or or, or go with a uh, go for a walk with my family or these kind of things, or somebody mentioned a church softball game, these kind of things, as long as they don't impede with the worship, the the public worship, I, I think was the language. Is that is that what you guys were thinking? I see heads nodding. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It, it, Colt, you want to say something? The, the confession comes across stronger, like it, it's not a, like it's not okay to do anything else. Yeah. Almost. Well, there there are several things to say about this, and it's another case of we need to know something about what's going on in the background and why things are phrased the way that they are, because it's the common language of the Westminster Confession, the Savoy Declaration of 1658, and the Baptist Confession of 1677. They're all they're all in agreement on this. You know, it's interesting, my friend Bob Godfrey, retired president of Westminster Seminary, published this book a couple of years ago, Saving the Reformation. And in the back, in Appendix 5, he gives a, uh, a new translation of the doctrinal statement of, by the Synod of Dort on the Sabbath, okay? And he goes through and he translates it, and he, he makes the sixth, I'm not sure what they call what this is, the, the, the heading is on the Sabbath, and there are six subpoints. And the sixth one, he says, This day must be so consecrated to divine worship that on it one ceases from all servile works, except those of love and present necessity, and also from all such refreshing activities as impede the worship of God. And then in a footnote, he says this, The Latin word translated refreshing activities is recreationibus, which has traditionally been translated recreations, that traditional translation has connotations in English that the Latin word would not have had in the 17th century. The word stands in contrast to servile works and means restorations, recoveries, or refreshings. Now, that's, that's, Dr. Godfrey has done us a favor there because he reminds us that language changes over the course of centuries. And this is true of a document that was written towards the end of the 17th century where we're coming up on 350 years of of this confession of faith because it first saw the light of day in 1677 so in 2027 we'll be at 350 years so it's an old document and sometimes the terminology changes over time so we we read recreations and we think football games but maybe that's not precisely what was intended in their use of the language and i think that his translation of, of the Synod of Dort's canon on the Sabbath is helpful because he, he reads it as refreshings, not recreations. Let me, let me go to our confession of faith and put it in the context of Westminster. There was a, a great uh, conflict that erupted under King James I over the importance of keeping the, the first day of the week as something of a Sabbath day or allowing it to be a day of pleasure. And in 1617, 1618, King James published under his own name uh, a book that was called The Declaration of Sports. Typically, it's referred to as the Book of Sports, but that, that's what it was called when it was issued, The Declaration of Sports. And then it was reissued under his son, Charles I, in 1633. This was a specific attempt to undermine what the Puritans were saying about the, the, the things, John, that you just mentioned. All of those things they would have agreed with you on. The fourth commandment, the continuity of the moral law, the importance of one day in seven of worship. They would have acknowledged all of those things. But the bishops and the king wanted to impose upon them to be writ read in church. The Declaration of Sports was intended through the bishops to be read in, in church obviously, to step on the toes of the Puritans, okay? Now, what, what did the Declaration of Sports, what was it about? Here's a quotation from a man who wrote in support of the Declaration of Sports, okay? So he was an advocate, 
and he's telling us what types of things are to be conducted on the afternoon of the Lord's Day and promoted by the church. Leaping, dancing, running, or any mastery for to goal or prize, meaning uh, running races where you you come to a goal. The Maypole or church ale. (laughs) Church ale is, is kind of hilarious. This was literally what it says, an opportunity for people to get drunk at church in the afternoon on the Lord's Day. Um, They would sell ale. Often it would be a fundraiser of some kind. And they would gather together, and the main course would be the ale that was produced. And so, you know, here's a Puritan minister who is concerned not just with the holiness of the day, but of sobriety in people's lives. And yet he's told that he has to promote the dancing around the maypole and the church ales and all this. So all of this is in the background to the Westminster language that we find in our Confession of Faith. So it's it has to be read in its context and understood in that context where you've got the political power of the day seeking in every way to undermine what is perceived to be a, a, a day that is largely to be given over to wor- the worship of God. So that's what it's about. So maybe maybe we don't have any... Ex- no. So in our confession, the, the word... Oh, sorry, Jay, you go ahead. I was just going to say, maybe go we ahead. don't have any exceptions then. In our con- <laughs> maybe maybe we don't have any quibs or exceptions then. Uh, maybe Dr. not. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I suspect that you don't. I, it's not out of step with the canons. So. Yeah, it, it really isn't. Now, let's it, have there been some who have gone exceptionally far in the way that they apply the principles? Yes, okay? I was recently reading about A.W. Pink, okay? And when Pink moved to Stornoway on the Isle of Lewis up in the north, outer Hebrides of Scotland, he attended an English-speaking service at a Free Church of Scotland congregation in the afternoon. Of course, Stornoway is largely Gaelic-speaking, but and Pink being English-speaking, they did have an, an afternoon service that was in English. But one of the principles in that congregation, now this is in the uh, 1940s, was that when the service was over, everyone was to leave in silence. So you were were instructed not to speak to each other because that would violate the sanctity of the day. You know what? That's going way too far. And that's not what the confession of faith is about. So we acknowledge that there there have been excesses, but let's not... um, Let's not let the excesses rule our, our understanding. It seems like the word worldly in our confession, worldly employments and recreations is really important there in clarifying what's being and, and worldly doesn't mean sinful. It, it means common every day. We, we just did a couple of podcasts on the Sabbath. Uh, so maybe in a few weeks uh, you can listen to theology in particular and we, we talk about this in detail. Yeah, that's good. We'll try to listen. I hope that that's helpful. That's very helpful. So if one was, if somebody was listening to this podcast and they're thinking, well, I'm going through these levels of subscription and trying to decide uh, where I fall in on these, are there some principles for helping them choose some or some resources that we can point people to as they're thinking through this issue? One principle that I, I, I think needs to be stated is that everyone strictly subscribes to something. Without exception, every single person does. If you believe in uh, what were some of those categories before, uh, doctrine divides, love unites, you're still strictly subscribing to the fact that you don't want to subscribe to a confession of faith and that love is the principle that brings people together, that you love Jesus. If you, if you work your way through all 10 of those categories, every single one of them requires of people a certain level of commitment to doctrines. So I I would argue that when you come to make a choice of how you will subscribe to a confession of faith, recognize that at some level you will be strictly subscribing to some of its contents. And if you choose a looser form of subscription, make sure that you understand the internal relationships between the various doctrines before you simply say, well, you know, I, I, I like the confession of faith, but I'll give you an example. Uh, I've read men who, who have said, well, I could, I could agree with uh, the 1689 confession, 
if you could take out the chapter on the law and take out those two paragraphs on the Sabbath, and then I could I could make it my own. And uh, but the problem with that is that that fails to recognize that chapter nineteen of the law of God and chapter twenty two seven and eight on the Sabbath have intimate connections to much of the rest of the the uh, the document, and to take them out is to really rip out holes in the confession of faith. So if you choose those, a, a level of subscription such as those, recognize that it has consequences. The second thing that I would say is I don't trust myself. I, I don't have confidence in my own wisdom and reasoning. I believe what the Lord Jesus said, that the Spirit would lead the church into the truth, and that the the teachers who have taught me today, living teachers, and also the men whose books are on these shelves, and the teachers that go back for centuries, have been careful, many of them have been careful in their exegesis of Scripture and in the conclusions that they draw. And when they acknowledge a common faith, I, I want to submit to that and say, who am I to sit in judgment on doctrines that have been widely accepted by Christians for centuries. Uh, you know, I've, I've been in churches uh, in many places that will, when they come to observe the Lord's Supper, use the Apostles' Creed or the Nicene Creed. Everybody recites it. And one of the things that I like to do when I'm in those situations is imagine that I, I'm simply standing in a huge crowd of millions of people who are speaking in different languages but who are saying the same things that I am saying as I confess my faith in those terms. So a, a confession of faith gives me the opportunity of, of real comfort in that I'm not trusting in myself and my own wisdom and my own conclusions, my own exegesis, but I'm joining the faithful of all of the ages who together are glorifying God in their statement. So be careful when you subscribe to a confession of faith that you don't do it idiosyncratically through your own interpretation. Be humble and recognize that there are a lot of men and women who have gone before us, who have understood these truths, and it's our it's our great privilege, really, to join with them as we confess them. I, I, to me, I, I realize that it's uh, Christianity is not a, a religion that's just about emotion, but there, there's an emotional strength that that gives to me when I contemplate all of those voices and all of those people with different color skin and, and they lived in different places and many of them didn't even know that the American continents existed and yet they can say, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth and in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, etc. What a wonderful thing that we join with them in saying those things. Dr. Ennin, you've written now on the first London Confession and on the second, and is that are those both out? Uh, volume uh, one is out, which is on the first London. It's published by Founders Press. Uh, if you go to their website, you can purchase it. It's called uh, For the Vindication of the Truth. Volume two is complete. It's in the hands of the editor. I hope to have it back, the proof, this month, with, well, within the next 10 days or so. And uh, hopefully that'll be published before the end of the year. Its title is to the judicious and impartial reader. And both of those titles are taken from the documents themselves. But it, it does a lot of what I've been talking about here, putting the confession into its context and recognizing that our fathers were taking up ideas that were common theological commitments of English Puritanism and, and beyond. If you go over to the, uh, the European continent and think about the Reformed churches there. So that's that's what I'm trying to do, is put it into its context and, and give a, an exposition of what its sense was. I, I put it this way. Imagine, you know, it, it first saw the light of day in 1677, and the first literary reference to it is in the Petty France Church book in late August of 1677. So let's, let's give four to six weeks for a publication. So let's say it's late September, early October in 1677, and you're, you're a member of one of the London churches. And this document has come into your hands, and you're sitting down to read it. Okay, you, you're looking at it. What would you? How would you understand its doctrines? If if you're a, as a Christian in one of those churches, you you've benefited for years from good, solid preaching ministry. 
you understand Christian theology. How would you understand that document? That's what I, I'm trying to build. So I want to, uh, we can't go into the minds of those men, but I think we can understand the, the theological context of those men and say, this is how they would have understood this statement or that statement. Yeah, me too. That's that's good. Well, thank you so much for, for taking some time and, and being with us today and uh, just a a great and helpful conversation. If you would, just after we stop here, just hang on and we'll uh, record a little bit of bonus contact, content. And if somebody wants to, to check that out, uh, we're going to talk about practically how the 1689 Lennon Baptist Confession has uh, benefited your ministry. So stay tuned for is that, that. Is that sort of the director's cut? The director's cut. That's right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thanks for listening, everybody. Thanks for listening. You can find more information about us and check out past episodes on the website at renewalcast.com, or you can connect with us on social media like Facebook, facebook.com slash renewalcast. We will see you again next week, Lord willing.